Conversations That Matter is a partner program for the Center for Dialogue at Simon Fraser University. The production of this program is made possible thanks to the support of the following and viewers like you. Welcome. Thank you very much for having me. Generation Squeeze, what an interesting concept. Where did it come from? What does it mean? Generation Squeeze refers to both a problem and a solution. The problem is threefold. First, uh, the standard of living is in decline for younger Canadians in their 20s, 30s, and 40s. They earn thousands less for full-time work, even though they're more than twice as likely to have post-secondary. More start with student debt as a result, and then they face housing prices that are up hundreds of thousands of dollars across the country, let alone in Vancouver, where we meet today. The second issue is governments are much slower to adapt to the problems facing a younger demographic than they are to others, including our parents and grandparents we love and want to protect. And the third theme is, why are governments slower to adapt for a younger demographic? And the reality there is many younger people feel that politics is broken. Uh, but what Jen Squeeze points out is politics isn't broken. It still responds to those who organize and show up. And a younger demographic is less effective at showing up, both on voting day and in the year in advance of elections when platforms are being designed provincially and federally. So the solution is for us to squeeze back by getting better organized and using our clout in the world of politics as well as our parents and grandparents have historically done. Okay, before we get to that, Let's talk about how we got to this situation where you have this group. And when we talk about Generation Squeeze, we're, we're basically talking about people who are about 30 and younger. Am, am I right? Or does it reach a little higher up uh, the age scale? Yeah, it reaches higher than that, to be honest, because we're one of the data points around which we are organizing Generation Squeeze is when are people having young kids today? How do we capture the generations raising young children? And one of the realities of earning less, starting out with larger student debt and facing way higher, higher housing prices is people delay. And so you're, you're uh, going to commonly find a number of people in their later 30s, early 40s who have preschool age kids now. And that's a big change from the past, but we're trying to capture that entire demographic. And in addition, the data show that it's people in their 20s, 30s, and early 40s who've experienced either one or both of substantial drop in full-time earnings or much, much higher housing prices. So why is that different than, let's say, in the course of my lifetime? My parents had children when they were 20. I didn't have children until I was in my late 20s. My kids are looking at into their 30s. Life expectancy has gone up, career span has changed and so on. How is this different than, let's say, one and two generations ago? Two things. First, an expanding life course and stretching out the life course in and of itself wouldn't be a problem uh, if, biologically speaking, as a species, we actually, we, you know, we evolved to be having our kids in our in our late teens, early 20s. That's actually that's a prime biological moments to do it. There are added risks for women actually as you start to uh, um, have first births later on, both for I should say moms and kids. Second, we have to understand what is driving the delay, and partly, actually, it's mm -hmm. real commitments to achieving gender equality, which is fabulous. And so you have both women and men wanting to establish their careers more and more before starting their families. You see some evidence that dads are getting more involved when they're starting their families. That's the good news part. Right. But it's been equally driven by the fact that the standard of living has really declined. And so what is, it, you know, back in 1980, uh, the typical 20-something year old was more likely to be coupling up, living with a spouse, a, a partner, partner, a loved one, whatnot, on their own. But today, the typical 20-something is more likely to be living at home uh, with their adult parents. And that just shows the, the challenge of establishing one's financial foundation in this country from coast to coast. And that doesn't reflect a younger demographic being lazy. And this is one of the fundamental things that Gen Squeeze is on about. We're actually in the business of myth-busting for many younger people, and for older people, I might add. Because there's this sense that, oh, younger Canadians, they're lazy, they're consumer, they're entitled. And what we point out is, no, a younger demographic has put more time and energy into getting post-secondary than any group of people before. They're then willing to land jobs that pay less than they did a generation ago once you adjust for inflation. They're willing to delay starting their financial foundation and delay starting their homes because they're willing to work years longer to cobble together a down payment. Uh, and then they work months more to pay the average annual mortgage. Balance. So what's put young people in this position when they enter the workforce the jobs aren't there that provide them the kind of income that they need to have a quality of life, especially in a city like Vancouver, where the cost of living is going through the roof. 
Yeah, well, there are multiple factors. Let me pick three to be brief. The first, the returns on post-secondary today still help you outcompete someone who doesn't have post-secondary. And so, indeed, it's young people who are not having post-secondary more often than not who will be most challenged. Mm -hmm. um, but the thing is, if you have a bachelor's degree today, that doesn't let you outcompete someone with five to ten years more experience than you in the way that it did a generation ago. If you came out in the late 70s or early 80s, far fewer people had a bachelor's degree. So the fact you had one meant something more significant. And the economic data showed that there were greater returns when you started in your career for having that post-secondary yeah. certificate. Now it's more like having high school. Uh -huh. And so it's kind of just expected. Second of all, we all know we live in a more globalized world than we used to, and so employers and businesses have new opportunities to find efficiencies by having production done in places where labor is much more inexpensive. And as a result, that creates a dampening influence on wages here. And so we see that play out to, for a younger demographic today in ways that simply weren't a reality a generation ago. And then I think the third piece just simply is the cost of living. And oftentimes, you know, we will talk about it in cities like ours in, in Metro Vancouver where, you know, one of the big pressures driving housing costs is a sort of influence of foreigners. And the data are, you know, the data are to some degree confirming that and also raising questions. But here's the fundamentals. Across this country in 1976, there were about 22 million Canadians. And we were less likely to live in our big cities. You flash forward to today, there's 36 million of us, and we're more likely to live in our big cities. That creates some pretty straightforward supply and demand factors, especially in urban settings where the geographic space horizontally is reasonably constrained, which is why more and more we are looking skyward to find our homes to try and create more space. Uh, and as the homes are getting higher, regrettably so are the prices. I gotta get you to hang on for just a second while we take a quick commercial break. We'll be right back. Conversations That Matter is a not-for-profit program made possible thanks to the charitable support of the following and from viewers like you. Please visit conversationsthatmatter.tv and help us to continue to produce this program. So back in 1976, what was the average amount of time that somebody had to work to save enough money to have a 20% down payment versus today? In 1976, a typical 25 to 34 year old, lucky enough to land a full time job, had to work five years to five save years. that 20% down payment okay. on an average home. If you take that same scenario, and you'll have many young people say, but it's harder to land a full time job today, but just say, I'm going to compare those who've been lucky enough to do so. Now, across the country, they have to work 12 years to save that 20% down payment. In Metro Toronto, they have to work 15 years. In all of British Columbia, they will work 16 years. In all of British Columbia? All of British Columbia, the provincial that, that's average. That's higher than Toronto? That's higher than Toronto. Oh and then in gosh. Metro Vancouver, where about half the population mm -hmm. lives, one will have to save, one will have to work for 23 years to save a 20% down payment on an average home. So let's say you start saving when you enter your working career, 23 years later, for most people, they would think, well, I'm just about done. Mm -hmm. 23 years in, you're buying your first house? Yeah, the reality is more and more young people in the Metro Vancouver region are simply not setting their sights at an average, uh, an average home. So the average cost of housing in Metro Vancouver now is 813000 That's not for a house, that's for a home or often a condo with a balcony. So of course, many young people who make, in our province, $9,000 less for full-time work than did the same age person in 1976. It's our province that has had the biggest hit in full-time earnings of so anywhere is, is in the country. Is that adjusted earnings? Or yeah, is that's it adjusted actually, for inflation. Uh -oh. $9,000 less. Yes, for full-time work, the typical young adult, 25 to 34 in this province. If we're not attracting young people, what is the, the, the potential danger to a metropolitan area like Vancouver? Uh, well, uh, more and more I worry that our region is at risk of becoming a generational ghost town. And by that I mean like the ability for a young adult to make her his way in this region, in any way that approximates what we thought was becoming the norm just a few decades ago, is now f coming further out of reach and is more like a mysterious thing that you kind of see in the background, but we're not going to see much longer. You are see seeing young people feeling, even when they're talented, well-educated, landed decent jobs, maybe even at a Hootsuite, who then finally say, but even Hootsuite can't pay me enough to actually make a go of it here. And so we are pushing that labor force out with risks to, one, 
how over a few decades from now do you sustain the vibrancy of our economy in this region? And more generally, how do you keep an intergenerational space where you have young, you know, young adults caring for their aging uh, parents, you have uh, aging parents caring for their gr grandchildren? These kinds of things are being squeezed. Oh, no, that's not. I was going like this. Squeeze. I guess strained. Um, stretched and squeezed. Stretched and squeezed, stretched yeah. and squeezed in ways that are are challenging for the region. There are long-term consequences if you are not, you know, continually refreshing ideas and talent and people and the economy, I think, starts to uh, miss out on a wide range of opportunities. It starts to miss out on a wide range of opportunities and it starts to actually put at risk its sustainability. Sustainability also is a social issue and right now we have ourselves a little bit deluded, I would argue, by lovely rankings in The Economist, which showcase Vancouver routinely being in the top five, sometimes the top three, occasionally I think we were even the top city on the planet to live, and the people who are writing those articles ne must never talk to anyone in their 20s, 30s, or 40s who was, I would actually identify this being the city on the continent that's more challenging to make a go of it than anywhere else. So what are our solutions? I think it begins to some degree with having a little bit of a reality check at the individual and collective level in, in government. I was in the budget lockups in February for BC and found myself really tuned in as the finance minister was talking about what was and what was not in their budget in terms of thinking about changing policy with respect to housing. And I was caught off guard when the finance minister routinely said, look, we make housing policy for the province. We don't make housing policy for a couple of neighborhoods in Point Grey, Vancouver. And by making that suggestion, we're making that claim, the finance minister, in my view, is suggesting housing unaffordability is only really a problem in a select few neighborhoods in this region. But that's not the case. Across the entire Metro Vancouver region, you'll only find 15% of homes that cost under half a million dollars, which is twice what an average home used to cost, and actually provide two bedrooms. Wow. And this means it is not, you know, housing unaffordability isn't a problem in a few neighborhoods in Point Grey, Vancouver. Housing affordability stretched out through the entire metro Vancouver region and by national standards the entire province. And so we need to start uh, solving this problem with recognitions by decision makers that for a big part of our population in their younger t 20s, 30s, early 40s, newcomers to the province, the housing market's actually broken. This is our second break. We'll be back in just a moment. Conversations That Matter is a not-for-profit program made possible thanks to the charitable support of the following and from viewers like you. Please visit conversationsthatmatter.tv and help us to continue to produce this program. We've been told for decades that your home is your single most important investment and so it becomes embedded into our thinking that that's what it is. It's an investment. But what you're saying is we have to stop thinking that way because it's driving the market. I'm definitely saying we need to start with the following kind of proposition that you know housing market supply homes first, investment second. And that doesn't mean I don't want people to make returns. Think about my mom. My mom's a lovely, about to be 72-year-old woman who was a lone mother for many of my years, made many sacrifices for me, worked really hard, doesn't collect her full pension as a teacher because she had years out of the labor market with me and other challenges. And one of the things that actually gives my mom quite a lot of financial security right now is back in the day, she had a, a, a home when I was a, a young kid. She could afford, she could afford a home. In fact, she had a home in West Vancouver of all places. Can you imagine? And then we had to sell and we moved to Vernon and she had another home. Um, and she's had another home. And the increases in housing prices over the years has provided my mom and many other people in her demographic with markedly more wealth from housing than previous generations ever reported in this. But my mom's nervous for her kids and her grandchildren because she sees what's benefited her is actually having the exact opposite effect for her kids and grandchildren. For some, pushing home ownership completely out of reach. That as a result, pushing space for her grandchildren out of reach. You know, what does it mean when families can't send their kids out to play in a yard, but they say, go play in the balcony. And it's just a fundamentally different thing. Or go play in the kitchen around me as I've come home from work at six o'clock. I'm a bit scattered, but I just love you playing around me as I'm cooking. And so my mom worries about those kinds of things and or it weighs people down with remarkably heavy debt loads that the governor of the Bank of Canada likes to occasionally take pot shots at. So back to what's our solution. Uh, you know, if if... Uh, investment is one of the driving factors. We know that people flip homes, but the, the province has put in measures to say if you sell your home within two 
years, you are going to pay a capital gain that you wouldn't when it's your primary residence. You're saying in reading your report that that's not good enough. We absolutely need to do that kind of thing. We need to minimize the degree to which speculation is driving the local housing market. And I mean, housing has typically been uh, a really protected asset from the standpoint of housing. If it, your primary residence, you're not going to be paying capital gains if you sell it within a relatively short period of time. Um, and we may, we may want to rethink that if you sell even your primary residence within six months, 12 months, 18 months. I, I think you know, that would be consistent with the homes first, um, investment second. You can still make a return on flipping homes, but we're going to start taxing it in ways that we haven't done before. And so we need to contain housing prices. But here's the rub. Because we need to contain housing prices, that's different than saying we want housing prices to drop. Because housing prices to drop puts my mom and other people who have been in the market for some time who are counting on those um, that at home equity for their own retirement security. Like they don't want it to drop. That would create a great deal of tension. So one of the I think really innovative ad, uh, ideas that Jen Squeeze is bringing into the conversation about how do we deal with housing and affordability is we say the problem may start with housing. The solution may not need to be housing policy. So w imagine if suddenly in this city, it weren't the case that uh, when you're starting your family, sharing time at home with a new baby costs the equivalent of losing another year's mortgage payment through parental leave. Imagine instead of losing $15,000 a year from your after-tax income compared to when before the baby was born, you only lost two or three thousand. Boom! That's a big savings that could help you with this year's mortgage payment. How do you make that happen? Now that's a policy change that's completely in our grasp. I mean, if we don't mm -hmm. like the fact that parental leave right now leaves people with tremendous hits to their income, we could say. Hmm. Internationally, most countries do it better than we do. They have more generous benefit levels. They have slightly longer benefits. They reserve some time to make it more feasible for dads to get involved, even though dads are lousy breastfeeders. Like, we could do that, which would be good for families with kids, and then relieve some of the financial pressure uh, that comes with that moment in life, which then they can reallocate to saying, I'm going to deal with this harder housing issue. And similarly, you know, would, with childcare. Do you see that as a government policy or? Uh, industry also has to pay for it. Indus uh, we, I think in this particular case what we're talking about is, is using our general revenue more effectively to invest better in things like parental leave, better in things like child care services, make sure those things don't cost the equivalent of second and third mortgage payments when people are at this really expensive moments in their life and facing really high housing prices. So it's a, it's a collective rather than the individual because as a small business owner I go, eh, I don't know how that I can handle well, that. Well this is precisely yeah. it. I mean I don't think we can expect that uh, employers, large or small, in and of themselves, have to be primarily responsible for in increasing wages to keep pace with housing prices that are growing far, far faster than is economic growth. Mm -hmm. And so, given that we don't want to strain our employers in that way and hold them entirely responsible for that problem, we need to say, okay, one part of the competitiveness for our employers in this country is to say, how can we help you have fair but competitive wages, and one way that we do that is we, at expensive moments in people's lives, we use our collective resources to bring some of those costs down. So that's the okay. cost around family, child care, maybe transit to some degree. We already do that with respect to medical care, which helps us outcompete the right, United States. Because we recognize that as being an issue that affected people, and collectively we came together following the model of Tommy Douglas. Are yeah. you suggesting that we create a national policy that is going to ensure that young people can become engaged in the housing market so they're looking after their housing needs and fostering healthy family growth. Well, I'm glad you raised Tommy Douglas. I actually, uh, more and more, I turn my attention back to the history books about what was going on in Saskatchewan that led to a Tommy Douglas back in the day. And, and what does that tell us for contemporary society in Canada. And one of the things I find interesting is that the history books show that, you know, back in the 30s and 40s, it was a difficult it was difficult to find a doctor that you could afford anywhere in the country. We hadn't built our healthcare system yet. But the problem it turns out was especially acute in Saskatchewan. And so as a result, it wasn't actually a coincidence that the now great Canadian Tommy Douglas happened to actually come from that province because he saw firsthand that, wow, People are becoming sick and unable to access doctors in ways that are tremendously unfair. And this is a particularly bad problem in my province, but then he started looking around and saying, this is a problem across the country, and he dreamed differently for us. And he said, there's got to be a better way by which people can access doctors and we can make that affordable. And eventually his dream 
became a policy adaptation across the country, and we now largely define ourselves as a nation by the fact that we're not our neighbors to the south. We have this health care system. And I think if you flash forward to today, we're in a similar scenario. Across the country, housing prices have more than doubled after inflation compared to 1976, all the while earnings for young people have gone down. But the problem is especially acute in the province of British Columbia and especially in the region of Metro Vancouver. And I think just as back in the day Tommy Douglas saw a problem in his re region and then dreamed differently in a way that uh, spread a solution across the country, now we need people to dream differently about what's happening in this region and spread the learnings across the country so that we once again make this country Country, a place where you can start off and have hard work pay off in the way that it used to. Because right now, hard work's not paying off nearly as it did, and it's constraining families, and it's making young people feel at risk of failure. Our final break before we get to the exciting conclusion about, you know, what are some of the solutions here, we'll be right back. Conversations That Matter is a not-for-profit program made possible thanks to the charitable support of the following and from viewers like you. Please visit conversationsthatmatter.tv and help us to continue to produce this program. We sit here and think, oh, we're this anomaly, but Seattle is under many of the same pressures that we are. Are they experiencing these same kinds of problems? Not to the same degree. And here's one of the things that Generation Squeeze is actually pretty honest about. Nowhere have we ever suggested that every generation always deserves an improving standard of living. I mean, it's kind of the American dream, the Canadian dream, but nowhere is it written that thou shalt always have a better standard of living than your parents. Gen Squeeze is willing to concede, actually, younger Canadians are probably gonna have to suck it up and, ha and do with less, make less for their hard work. But the thing that frustrates us is that in Canada, We've had a proud tradition of building and adapting public policy in the past to solve problems facing entire generations that individuals cannot work themselves out of alone. Mm -hmm. And that's the piece where things seem to be breaking down right now. Yeah. yeah, but does that not come back to your earlier point about becoming politically engaged and active? And are we starting now to see that with the election of Trudeau, the, the, the swell of support by young people behind Bernie Sanders? Um, Partly, yes. No, the answer to the, you know, the problem is absolutely getting organized in the world of politics. That's absolutely the solution. Um, and partly I think we're seeing some early signs of that in the election of Justin Trudeau, maybe with what's going on with Bernie Sanders, although it's kind of ironic that there's such a young demographic seeing Bernie Sanders, which is one of the older people I think running for office right now is the savior. But let's just leave that part aside. <laughs> right. um, I work in the School of Population and Public Health at the University of British Columbia. More often than not, you think about health as about like, what are the surgical techniques or the pharmaceutical drugs that we're gonna create to help a particular individual body become healthier after it's become sick? And what I do in the School of Population Health is think about, we need health interventions at the body politic level. Because right now, we know politics responds to those who organize and show up. And when we have great groups like the Canadian Association of Retired Persons lobbying for decades on behalf of an older demographic, we have this conduit by which we can take good research evidence and have it filter into political parties across the ideological spectrum. And as a result, it's been more likely to come into government budgets and policy works, which is why Global Age Watch ranks Canada as one of the very best places on the planet to grow old. But by contrast, there's never been a similar group wanting to build clout and advocate on behalf of younger Canadians in the world of politics when they're in their 20s, 30s, and 40s. And as a result, we haven't had that conduit for research evidence to make its way into provincial and federal budgets. And so groups like UNICEF rank Canada as one of the worst industrialized countries on the planet when it comes to raising uh, or families raising young kids. But now enter Paul Kershaw and Generation <coughs> Squeeze. I wish you all the best of luck. I thank you for coming in and doing this.